are we? Are we good? Yeah, it's okay to be bad. It, it really is. If you're bad, you're in the right place. My favorite things I have. Had microphone problems everywhere this morning. Those that were watching online got to hear me and Gary Raspberry talk about Auburn and North Carolina basketball this morning. I had a microphone in my hand and we didn't know we were broadcasting live to the internet. So now y'all know, they know about uh, a little bit more about Auburn basketball and North Carolina basketball. Uh, Gary has a, uh, Gary has a great nephew who's uh, maybe the leading scorer, I'm not sure, of uh, uh, North Carolina, at play at North Carolina right now. And so he, uh, uh, if you, his name's Brady Mannix, so I've been enjoyed being able to keep up with him the last few years. So, um, we are uh, in, in continuing our series through Galatians, and this morning we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Old Testament and the Old Testament as what we we would come to know as the Old Testament. Old Testament is kind of a a complicated subject for us as Christians. I, it's been my experience that most people haven't really become very comfortable with how we read and what we read for the new, uh, in the Old Testament. Some people uh, just kind of dismiss it. Some people view it as like this set of moral stories. We, we view characters and we find characters say, yeah, be like David or don't be like Samson. Samson's a terrible person, by the way, uh, almost all the way through. And sometimes in Bible class, we talked about him being good. He was not good. He was really bad. Uh, and did a lot of bad things, and you know. So, but we a lot of times that's what we do, and we've kind of been struggling, I think, to kind of understand what we do with the Old Testament. And uh, Paul kind of takes this break here. It's not really a break, but he's trying to relate to these Judaizing teachers that are harassing the Galatian churches to try to keep tell them you've got to come back and you've got to keep the old law, specifically the Mosaic law, which would have been what God brought down specifically to Moses. And now they're trying to determine what is their relationship to the old law. And for us as Christians today, I still think we have this problem. We struggle with how to relate to it. When I go and I meet people, anytime I meet people, one of the first questions I ask, my wife accuses me of being, I ask too many questions and I do. I usually will ask people, what do you do for a living? I think that's a pretty good icebreaker because most people like to talk about what is their job and they like to share uh, the things they do. But one of the follow-up questions I almost always have to ask is, I, I know what your title is, but what do you do for a living? Like when you go into your office or you go into your, your computer, what, what is it that like you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? And what's so interesting is many times they'll say, I'm this, and they'll give me a title and I have no idea what it means, but I'll, I'll kind of piece together in my mind what I think that would look like. And many times it's, totally different than what it, what it actually was, wasn't it? And I think that's kind of the way things have been with the Old Testament, that we say, well, well what is the Old Testament? And then we ask, well, well, what do you do with it? Like, how do you, how does it piece together? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that this morning as we dig into uh, Paul trying to correct these early Christians. And for them, you have to understand, they come from a, a very different perspective than we do. They were from the old coming into the, the new covenant, the new uh, administration of grace that was found in Jesus. And we, having already been in this, now we're trying to go back and ask, well, how, do we, how does the Old Testament make sense to us today? We're not going to answer that question at total length today. We're not going to be able to do that. It would take really a series of lessons, a series of lessons that uh, I hope to do at some point in time. But, but I do want to kind of give us a, a broad overview and Paul is doing this because he realizes that these people that are coming in and they're causing problems in the church have to reset the lens in which they're going to read Scripture. We all read Scripture with lenses, and we'll talk about that a little more as we go. Let's dig into our text. Galatians chapter 3, we're uh, to finish through verse 14 last week. We'll pick up in verse 15 this week. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Now, 
You can almost guarantee that if somebody is taking an example from everyday life 2,000 years ago, it's probably not going to match up A to A to what we deal with today. So this is, you're going to say, this is not everyday life, but it would have been for them. And there's actually a, a great deal of mystery as to exactly what Paul is even talking about here, uh, what cultural influence he's talking about, but you'll, you get the main idea of it here. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Now, what is this human covenant that he's talking about? What would this mean? Well, it would have been uh, just as a, a general idea to get your mind wrapped around this. This would be kind of like a situation in our culture where you had a will and somebody died and somebody didn't like what was in the will, and they said, we need to change the will. Well, after the person is deceased, it's too late to change the will. Some of you have had experience with this, haven't you? You've had to deal with situations where somebody had not updated their will, and it can get really messy, can it, if, if things are not in order. Uh, I, I actually, I'm not going to identify, I'm not going to give a whole lot, of, but I, I, I had a friend who, whose granddad was like, rich i mean not like you know wealthy but like rich like I, I was told it was not billions but it was really close okay so just you know more money than most of us will ever see and his will you would think somebody that had hundreds of millions of dollars would have a will that was perfectly in order but guess what it wasn't and you know what happens when hundreds of millions of dollars are at stake you lose family members and friendships and things go south. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Well, Paul's saying, listen, you can't go back after, after it's established and go back and change the game, so to speak. And he's going to begin talking about really the two periods of uh, Scripture. When we talk about the Old Testament, we're usually talking about a group of 39 books. But within that Old Testament... There was a time and place really where they had kind of an Old Testament and a New Testament. They had the law in the time of Abraham, not the law, but the covenant relationship of Abraham. And then they come and they have the, the Ten Commandments and all the laws that come through the Pentateuch through Moses. And so Abraham and Moses be, become kind of these symbols for these periods of time. And Paul sets out to define, to help people understand that when we talk about Abraham and we talk about Moses, the fact that Moses came along does not totally mean now that Abraham is out of the picture. As a matter of fact, Moses is, and this is the filter, we talk about this lens that we read through. Do we read Moses through Abraham or do we Abraham and Moses? And we're going to talk about that very briefly here in just a second. He says, what I mean is this, the law, which would be the the Mosaic period, I guess we would say, for lack of a better term for us, just to get in our mind. Think about Ten Commandments and the time after that. Introduced 430 years later. So 430 years after the covenant with Abraham, Moses comes onto the scene and he receives the law from God. He says it, does not, it did not set aside the covenant previously established by God. Some people think, and this is what we sometimes struggle with our relationship, Old Testament, New Testament, that, that when the New Testament comes into effect, well, the Old Testament just doesn't have anything for us anymore. It does make it more complicated. Uh, there are things that we don't do, and that's exactly what Paul's teaching in Galatians, that we don't have these ritualistic laws and things. But, but there are things, that's our family history. There are things we learn about God in, in this passage. There are things that, quite honestly, they're just good morals for living at times that are things that Christians are going to continue to do. And so it, it changes, it shifts, but it doesn't eradicate. And specifically here, Paul's saying, listen, just because you have Moses and the law now, and by the way, the Pharisees and the people that Jesus would have encountered and Paul would have been encountered, they were called experts in the law. Not experts in the covenant, which was the promise to Abraham. They became experts in the law. They knew how to legally define, or they felt that they knew how to legally define 
and just give these very strict precision, obedience type factors to the old law, to the law of Moses. And he says, listen, what the way you're interpreting the law of Moses is really doing away with Abraham. Abraham's just kind of become part of your history. And he said, you need to understand that when God comes in and sets up the law, and, and he comes in, he doesn't do away with the promise that is to Abraham. Now that's very significant for us because we are still recipients today of the covenant of Abraham. That through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Well, that's how we in this audience have been able to become Christians, have been able to become Christ followers. It's because of the promise that was given to Abraham. And so it's a good thing that they, but the people that Paul dealt with, they were kind of trying to kind of skip over that part or just leave that part out. And Paul says, listen, you need to reset how you're reading things. He says, for if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. God made a promise to Abraham, and one thing God does not do is go back on his promises. That's why we as Christians can look through and find the promises of God and we find great comfort in them because we know ultimately he will bring those things to truth, to fruition. And we may get impatient sometimes about how long it might take. We might get impatient about what we have to do to get there. But at the end of the day, God is faithful. He proves that in the Abraham narrative and through the life of Abraham. He says, listen, you need to understand that when God comes and gives the law, he doesn't do away with Abraham. So what Paul is doing is he's challenging the glasses they wear to understand Scripture. We all wear glasses when we come to Scripture. This is one thing I think it took me a long time to recognize and realize in my life is that there were things that I was taught, good things and maybe things that I question now, that created the lens in which I read Scripture. Uh, there were influences that happened long before me that have impacted what I came to grow and to learn to understand. They impact how I read Scripture. Uh, in many instances, I grew up in uh, an, an era in which I, I maybe is, I, I, I'll, I'm always cautious. I don't want. I was raised in such a good, godly home. I never want to give the impression I wasn't. But I viewed Scripture primarily as kind of a legal code. It's a, uh, you know, you come to the New Testament. You know, the word New Testament is something we gave it. Uh, and I really think, and I, I've tr I'm trying to shift my vernacular to talk about it as the New Covenant, because uh, very specifically the Bible talks about that when Jesus comes, he, it's a new covenant. It's a new, uh, it's a fulfilled covenant through Abraham. So many of you, we, we've got people in our audience that were raised in the Catholic Church. We've got people in this audience who were raised in Church of Christ. We've got people in this audience who were raised in Baptist churches. We've got people in here who were raised with no church at all. And you know what I know from all of that is that we were all raised, and while we can change the glasses, it takes a lot of work to change the glasses because these glasses are attached to our face permanently, okay? Uh, if you want to read Scripture, you've got to learn to try to read it as close to the original language as possible. But, but how do we do that? How, how do we sift through this? Do we read it more as a, is it a narrative? Is it a story? Or is it a science textbook? Or is it a history textbook? What, what is the Bible? Because you're going to read those, all those books very differently, aren't you? You sit down to a Stephen King novel, and you're going to read that a very specific way that's very different than what you would do if you sat down to a biology textbook, aren't you? Uh, with a biology textbook, some of you are going to, uh, there's a few of you in here that probably have, but uh, I don't think I've ever read all of a textbook before. Ever. Uh, I mean, you skip around, don't you? Even when you're in school, you kind of skip. Now, some of you probably are wired different than me, right? I'll never forget my senior year of high school when I admitted to my AP history teacher that I had not read all of any book when I was in high school. <laughs> I'd, I, mean, I read large chunks of it, but I learned you can read about the first three or four pages of every chapter, and you can pretty much fill in the rest. That's bad advice. Don't do that. But I, 
I got through high school, and I don't think I read all of any book. Um, and, you know, we read different things differently, though, don't we? Uh, how we read legal codes is very different than how we read a story about a family. Paul is telling them, listen, you need to understand that the lenses you're reading Scripture through, uh, they're, they're glued to your face, and you need to challenge the, the lenses. And we all need that challenge from times. Even if we come up at the end of the day and we read it the same way we used to, we need to be challenging the way we read Scripture. And so just a couple of questions, and this is the question that they had. Does Moses inform Abraham or does Abraham inform Moses? What's the most important part? Do we learn about Abraham by saying, all right, we're going to read through the lens of Moses and we see Moses and we know Moses and then we're going to go back to Abraham? Or do we learn about Abraham and does that inform us what we need to know about Moses? Now this comes into play for us in many different ways. A couple of additional questions is, and, and really what we're leaning in here, into here is, do we obey to be saved? Obedience is so important, church. I never want to leave you with the impression that obeying God is somehow like a, an option that Christians just can decide whether or not they do or don't want to do it. But, but what is your motiv motivation for obedience? Or do we obey because we are saved? I've come to believe that the greatest shift in my life is that when I chose to obey God, not because I was going to try to get something from Him, but I started obeying Him because of what He had already done for me. And that changed totally how I think about God. It changed how I read Scripture. It changed how I think about God. It changes the covenant relationship. Now, could I abandon God's relationship by disobeying every law he gave me? Absolutely. Sure. I can turn my back on God. But these are the questions we ask that help us determine how we read Scripture. And it's real similar to the situation that Paul is dealing with. They're having to ask, what lens do we read things through? Uh, another question, and this is, do rules define the relationship, or does the relationship define the rules? When, we, when you set up a marriage, a marriage, uh, anybody in here who is married would probably agree that there are rules in your relationship. But those rules are set in place primarily because of the relationship. I love you, therefore I'm going to follow through with certain things. I'm going to choose not to do certain things. We're going to have talks before we make this decision. We're going, to, we're going to have certain rules. And I do it because of the relationship that I have with you. But many times when marriages fail, it's because you start with the rules. You don't develop the relationship. And you start with the rules. And you know anybody that can tell you is the, one of the greatest predictors of whether or not a marriage is going to make it or not is a prenuptial agreement. If you go in already trying to set the rules for how I get out of this relationship, it's not likely to last. So, do rules define a relationship? Are, and this is just challenging you to think. Or what are the lenses that I think things through? Do I think of the Bible as a set of rules that are ultimately going to give me a relationship? Or do I think of the Bible as a relationship that I form with God that makes me happy to follow the rules, so to speak? What happens many times in marriages is that sometimes people will leave their marriage vows. Uh, many of you have had experience with that. Many of you have maybe, uh, maybe have had a spouse leave you, or maybe you've had family members where a spouse has left the relationship uh, to find uh, companionship in somebody else. You know what you find a lot of times happens when that happens, when marriages are trying to mend maybe from an affair? Well, guess what happens in those relationships? You get a lot more rules, don't you? Yeah, you're not... I'm going to know where you're at while we rebuild trust here. Well, in many ways, that's exactly what happens with the relationship when we go from the covenant relationship, the promises of Abraham, to the rules that we think of with Moses. God had a group of people who had left the relationship and they kept having an adulterous relationship. They kept following after and not following after God, and they were, they were breaking the rules of the relationship. 
And they had lost sight of what the relationship was supposed to be. And so they suddenly are going to have a lot of rules. Say, since you can't stay faithful to me, we're going to have to have some rules in place until I can trust you again. And that's exactly what happens in this situation. So let's continue reading. We're going to see that play out here. Why then was the law given at all? So the question is, is if the covenant is the lens that we read Scripture through, and I think that's what Paul is telling you here, is listen, you've got to view the covenant with Abraham as the lens that goes forward, and you, you view the law through the lens of Abraham, and not vice versa. Okay, You read from the beginning to the end of the book, not from the end to the beginning. He says, through, so through this lens of Abraham, you get to the law. Why was the law given? Well, it was added because of transgressions. It was added because... People didn't keep the law. There's a lot of uh, there's a, a lot of debate actually in Christian community. There's this is actually a pretty controversial piece of pass, passage. And I'm not going to get into the weeds of everything and all the details of that. I don't even understand all the weeds that some of these some of these pa- these texts actually give us. But there's uh, some people believe that God gave the law because there was sin. Some people believe that God gave the law in order that people might know what sin is. Okay, You can count me most likely in that second camp, but uh, either way, regardless, the idea is that the law had to come into place because the relationship was broken. The relationship was on uneven terms. You had a people who were adulterous towards God, and God says, hey, if you're going to be my people, we're going to be married to one another. You can't continue to be adulterous towards me. And we're going to have some guidelines set up so that you're not, so you don't do that. He said it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law comes into play so that you can get to Jesus. So that we can get to understanding. And now, what do we have in Jesus? We have not a set of rules, even though... There might be rules that define a relationship. But we primarily with Jesus, we have a relationship with God. He says, listen, the rules were set in place until we could fix the relationship. So the law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. And this is getting into some of the weeds here. But so the angels come and they entrust it to the mediator. The mediator here is Moses. And a mediator, however, implies more than one party. But God is one. He says, is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Did the law come in to take away Abraham? It's certainly not. It wasn't the case. He says, absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Paul clearly states, you cannot get to the kind of relationship that you have if the relationship is just a bunch of rules. You know, there's that old saying, and it's so true, that people don't care what you know until they know that you care. That ultimately, if we're going to coexist as humans, it's, it's founded first on having a relationship. Now, here's the thing, and you need to understand this, and you, I think, understand this. There are rules in every relationship I have with every one of you. And every one of you have rules within your relationships with each other. Now, we don't necessarily go right down on a paper, right? Uh, but if I came up to you after church when you're coming and shake my hand, I just slap you across the face. I've violated a rule in our relationship, haven't I? Now, we've never written down on paper that the preacher is not supposed to slap people across the face. But if I did it, you would realize there was a rule. It was an unspoken rule, but it was a rule. So, you understand this relationship, every relationship has rules. There's no escape in that. There's things you do and don't do, right? But I'm not slapping you because there's, I'm not not slapping you because there's a rule, okay? I'm not slapping you because I don't want to slap you. Uh, it's not just because, now, that, there's been a few times, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I'm just kidding, but you understand that the relationship is built on a relationship, and then there are certain rules that play off that just because it's how a relationship functions and works. This happens in marriage. It happens with relationships with your children. It happens in relationships with uh, just other people. Every relationship has certain rules that play part. He said, but if the rules 
if following rules was how you got righteous, then somebody would have already done it. But that's not the case, he says. He says it's through the relationship with Jesus. So scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Those who come into covenant relationship with God. Now when I'm in that covenant relationship with God, I'm going to want to follow the rules. And it's not because I feel like God gave me a bunch of rules I had to follow. I'm going to come into that relationship and I'm going to want to follow certain rules in our relationship because I love God. Because God loves me. And he says, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. You had a bunch of rules and you had to have experts in the law because you didn't have Jesus yet. And that now everything's going to come through Jesus. So the law was our guardian. It was a, a watch over us until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. We as Christians, we as people, have a problem being faithful, don't we? We have a problem with faithfulness. And, and God gave a bunch of rules, said if you'll just follow all these rules, you'll be, you'll be faithful. And we failed at that. And Paul says, listen, that law was given to, to guide us to the stage in which we could come see Jesus and everything finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Everything before and after Jesus finds its fulfillment in Jesus. This is why faith in Jesus is how we are saved, not by works of the flesh or works of the law. Now that this faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. So does the, do the rules of the Old, covenant, Old Testament play over us today. In many ways, they don't, right? Uh, we're not sacrificing animals this morning. Uh, we are not... Um, you, you make the list, right? We're, many of you are going to have bacon for lunch, right? Yeah. And when you eat that bacon, you're going to say, praise God. Right? Uh, many of you are... Uh, we weren't here yesterday, so we weren't observing the Sabbath. But here's what's interesting, is those principles, many of them are still in the same place, Right? We still, as Christians, need Sabbath. We need rest. We need a time of rest. That's, that's from, Jesus, from God from the beginning, models that for us, that there's six days and then he rests. And he models that because that's a universal principle, right? Uh, we no longer celebrate what we call the Passover, but every Sunday we celebrate uh, communion together, and that's to remember uh, the Passover lamb, our Passover lamb, Jesus who who makes it where we don't have to have Passover as, we, as they would have known it then. So, do these things matter? Absolutely. Uh, you need to understand that the Old Covenant matters, and there's so much of the New Covenant that makes no sense. Galatians makes no sense unless you really kind of understand the, the way in which these Judaizing teachers are coming into it. Why there? But he says, but now faith, faith in God, a belief in God is going to govern the relationship. It's going to be a relationship based on faith and trust and God's righteousness and holiness. So now we're no longer under the guardian. Old Testament matters a lot. The Old Covenant matters a lot. You are still a recipient of uh, the promise of Abraham. It, some people, you, you need to understand that if you just have the last 27 books, the last 27 books don't get you anything. They don't make any sense without understanding the covenant relationship that God formed with Abraham that you're a recipient of. So does the old covenant still matter? Does it still impact us? Does it, are we still bound to it? Well, we're still part of this promise, this covenant of Abraham. That hasn't changed. And Paul's pointing that out to the Jews. Listen, you need to go back to understand and quit, quit thinking law, law, law and start thinking covenant. An agreement that's come to a relationship that's come to between two parties. Because the covenant doesn't need a mediator. It doesn't need Moses. It doesn't need angels. It doesn't need other... No, now we have a covenant relationship with God. We have a covenant relationship with God that's modeled by Abraham, isn't it? How did Abraham receive instruction from God? Directly from God. 
And we today have the same type of relationship. And so we understand this. The law served as a temporary guide, an important guide, but a temporary guide that leads us into the mended relationship. The relationship was broken. Uh, the relationship was not uh, with God and his group of people. It was, it, that was, it was just it was a broken model. And God literally takes us through centuries upon centuries to show that if man could get it right without Jesus, they would have gotten it right. And nobody did it. Nobody was successful at it. So the law serves as this temporary guide to kind of just keep it on the road a little bit, okay? Uh, that leads us into the mended relationship that's mended not through our works, but through the goodness of Jesus on a cross and Jesus resurrected out of the tomb three days later. And that's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. You are children of God through faith. You are God's children. Um, I'm happy to be God's child. Um, a few months ago, uh, I got to go on a retreat. And uh, it was a preacher's retreat put on by Southeastern Christian Church uh, in Louisville. And uh, I may have mentioned some things. We, we got to do some really neat stuff. It was just, it was kind of a, it was a Sabbath for me. It was a time of refreshing. It was really good. It's been probably three or four months ago now. And one of the things that uh, was interesting there is uh, the person who, who leads this retreat, Bob Russell, uh, preached to that church for many years. And he, was, he led that church, I think it was 150 or so members when he got there. And he left it. It was the biggest restoration movement church in the United States. It's thousands upon thousands of people. Now the, the guy who's the, the lead minister there is Kyle Eidelman. If you've ever read the book, Not a Fan, uh, some of you probably have come across that book. You can, it was real popular several years ago. Kyle's an awesome speaker. Uh, and uh, Bob told us the story about uh, Kyle kind of came to him and said, is, you know, is there anything you'd like to see me do different? And Bob said, well, you know, I'm a little old school. I'd really like to see you in a suit and tie every now and then. He said, you know, if, if you were going to meet the president, would you show up in jeans and a shirt kind of like mine, which is what Kyle wears on most Sundays. And, he's, and Kyle looks at him and says, I would if the president was my father. And uh, Bob said he was right. And he said, I never complained about what he wore again. You know, when it's built on a relationship, it changes everything, doesn't it? Um, we are children of God through faith. God is our Father. Does God deserve our respect and our all? Absolutely. But can we talk to God just like He is our dad? Absolutely. Because He indeed is our Father. He's our dad. We are children of God through faith. We come to God and we go to God and we pray and we let out our frustrations and our fears and sometimes when we pray, sometimes we want to be so formal and we want to say all the right words. And I understand because I get up here every week and, I, and I'm trying to put a presentation in front of you and, and I try to say words that will influence you and, and I try to be, I'm not eloquent and many of you who are English people know I'm not, but I, I, you know, I, I understand I take a lot of thought into what I'm going to say when I get up here. But at the end of the day, when we go to talk to God, it's, it's, it's literally a relationship between a father and his children. And if we want to have the kind of relationship that we need with God, we've got to think about that relationship in that way. We're in a covenant, bonded relationship with Jesus. We chose to be adopted children of the greatest father that has ever existed and ever will exist. So we're all now in Jesus through faith, children of God. And then he adds this. He says, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. When I, when I started this series, I, first week, I said, you know, we talk about only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus. And one of the first things we in the church of Christ who have really put, I think, a really good emphasis on baptism through the years we, we've we say well what about baptism you know i've got to be but there's a rule i've got to keep right there's a rule of baptism that i've got to keep 
And I, I would just, here's what I want to pour out to you a little bit, that, that baptism is something that we do to put ourselves in a relationship with Jesus, but it's not a rule that we keep. We're becoming, we're being baptized into Christ because we want, we want to take on Jesus' name. We want to be clothed with Christ. And that's exactly what he says. He said, if you put on Jesus in baptism, and baptism is not something that you do, it's something that's done to you, by the way. You look in the original Greek, you're going to see this. That baptism is not a work that you do, it's something that's done to you. God puts you into a relationship with you. You clothe yourself with Christ. When you choose to put on Jesus in baptism, you need to understand that you're saying, I am taking the family name of God. I am choosing now to be clothed. And now I'm no longer Daniel, but I'm a Christian. I'm no longer Daniel Carrington. I, 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 I'm now a child of the everlasting God. And so we need to understand that is baptism, and this is the question, well, is baptism necessary? Well, I'll tell you two or three things. One, the idea of an unbaptized Christian is foreign to the New Testament and the New Covenant. When people came into relationship, when they came into covenant, the ceremony which they came into covenant with, into Jesus with, was baptism. Uh, now, so the question is, is, do we have to be baptized? Can somebody be saved without being baptized? And, and I'll tell you this right now. I'm not God. And I don't make those decisions. But I love my father, and he asked me if I wanted to be in covenant relationship with him, that I would be buried with him in baptism, I would be clothed by him. And so there, therefore, I would suggest that that's what we all do, right? We all come into covenant relationship. We, we're clothed, we're baptized into Jesus so we can take on the name of Jesus. And at the end of the day, let God determine who is and is not lost. And let's teach people what people did in order to come into covenant relationship with God. People in the New Testament came into covenant relationship with God by clothing themselves with Jesus. And so this whole talk that we're going through, it says, listen, you can't save yourself. You can't be, you, you work, salvation is not going to be the answer. And he says, listen, all of you who, and, and it's just assumed, all of you who have went through the, the marriage ceremony of God, okay? This is literally what he's saying is that it's like you, when you married yourself to Jesus through baptism, many of you who are married, you went through a marriage ceremony. Everybody in here who's married went through some kind of ceremony. It might be in a courthouse in front of a judge, but you went through a ceremony in which you got married and you came into covenant relationship with God. Now, you didn't stay married just because of the piece of paper on file at the courthouse, hopefully. But you stayed married because you loved that person. And it showed and it mended and bonded your relationship. The same thing happens when we choose to be baptized into Jesus Christ. When we're baptized in Jesus Christ, we, we are, it's a ceremony in which we join ourselves to Jesus and we take on the name of Jesus. We wash away the old self. We put on the new self. And I would just encourage you that if you're not a baptized believer, that you think long and hard about becoming a baptized believer because it is the ceremony, it is the moment in which we clothe ourselves with Christ. And if you haven't done that in your life, you need to clothe yourself with Christ. And quit worrying about all the details. And, and this is, we ask sometimes bad questions, I think. And we ask that, I've heard that question asked my whole life. Do I have to be baptized? You're starting off on the wrong foot when that's the first question, right? I get to be baptized. I get to join in relationship with Jesus. Can a person be saved outside baptism? Church, I know of a, a particular instance in which a person was literally in the car driving to the beach to be baptized in the water and had a heart attack and died. They committed themselves to Jesus. And my old self would say, well, you know, look, I could do the science and the math on that. Let me just tell you this. Leave those things in God's hands. I believe God is faithful and just and understands the intentions of our heart. There will be children in heaven that have never been baptized into Christ. There, I mean, will there be people in heaven that have not been baptized into Christ? Yes, absolutely. No question about it. There's going to be children. There's going to be people who had no mental ability to 
understand these things? No doubt about it. Will there be people who could have been baptized that weren't baptized in heaven? That is way above my pay grade. And if you get to that pay grade, we need to have a talk because you need to be standing up here, right? Because uh, we don't, uh, I don't know. I just know what God asked for us to come into faithful relationship with him. It would be marked by a ceremony of baptism. And the early Christians and the idea of an unbaptized believer in the early church was just not on the map. It wasn't an idea anybody had. So do you need to be baptized? Is a bad question. The question is, can I be baptized? Can I come in a covenant relationship of faithfulness with Jesus? And the answer is absolutely you can. And you should. And he says, so now you come into that covenant relationship with Jesus that's, that is rooted, by the way, in the covenant relationship found with Abraham. You come into that covenant relationship he says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All the barriers that have, and really, the, he throws in a lot of these, and they're important. But the one that would have been really, really important to this church was to understand that there is now neither Jew nor Gentile. If you are clothed with Jesus, if you are a baptized believer with Jesus, you are now one in Christ Jesus. You now have unity with Jesus, and you have unity with each other, and quit trying to divide what God has put together. And there's lessons we as a church and as a people can learn from that as well. So he said, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Does the Old Testament apply to us? I sure hope the promise to Abraham applies to me. Because it's the promise that allows me to be a Christian. And now we are heirs. We're in the will. We're in the will according to the promise of God. And praise God, we're in the will. Because not being in the will is not good. So, God invites us and he invited and was trying to correct the division that was happening in the Galatian church. He, he invites us into covenant relationship of faith. It's founded on the basis of faith. I believe in God, therefore I enter into a covenant relationship with him. And we enter into that, that covenant. I make that commitment to Jesus by clothing myself with Jesus and taking on the name of Jesus in baptism. And so I encourage you, if you've, if you've never thought about baptism, or maybe you, you've never, it's never something you just haven't gotten around to, don't, don't delay that relationship ceremony. Because you get to do it. And that's a blessing that you have in your life. You get to come into a public covenant relationship. Now I am a Christian with God. And praise God that Jesus alone is enough. The work that Jesus does in the cross, the, the work that Jesus did on the cross, and us believing in that is all we need in order to come into covenant relationship. You're not going to earn it by merits. And baptism in itself is not a way in which you earn your salvation. If dunking yourself in water somehow makes you earn salvation, then me and my brother were earning our salvation a whole lot when we were six and seven years old playing in the pool, right? That doesn't earn me anything. But when I choose to put on the name and take the name of Jesus, I, get, I say, Jesus, you, I'm, I'm making a confession that I, I can't be enough. I can't muster it. I'm not good enough. I put my faith and hope and trust in you to be the faithfulness, to be the righteousness. To put me at one meant to put me at one with God. Because I, by myself, am a failure. So if you've never come into that relationship with God, why won't you put your trust in Him today? Uh, come while we stand singing, or let somebody know before you leave. We would love for the day to be the day that you come into covenant relationship with God. If you have any needs of the church, you can come. We'll sing together.